Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Megan Trickrell. I'm a forms and content manager here at the Executives Club. We're so excited to have all of you logged on for Let's Make a Reservation, Chicago Restaurant Recovery. This event is brought to you by our Food and Beverage Forum, which is sponsored by our friends and partners over at Baker McKenzie. And we're very excited to bring this interactive discussion to you today. Um, so I'm going to hand things over to Christina Conlon, who's a partner at Baker McKenzie and one of our Food and Beverage Forum chairs. So over to you, Christina. Great, thank you, Megan. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us virtually today for this uh, panel. Let's make a reservation, Chicago Restaurant Recovery. I will say when Megan and I started planning this a few months ago, um, we were hopeful uh, with spring coming and vaccines and everything else. And um, you know, it's, it's nice to have everyone here today to talk about where we are and where we see this going. Um, this will be a lively discussion and there will be an opportunity for all of you to ask questions. At, um, at some point during the, uh, the presentation today. So I do want to, without further ado, introduce our expert panel of industry leaders and business owners to provide a firsthand um, experience and insight on the toll of COVID-19 on the Chicago restaurant industry, but also to really focus on the strength through the past year and the potential for recovery in the upcoming year and, and beyond. So first, let me introduce you to Bob Habib, who is the founder and CEO of Maverick Hotels and Restaurants, and he will be today's moderator. He will be leading this conversation with Adi Azi Godoy, who is general manager at Carnival, Darren Kreich, who is the founder of GSD Consultancy and Frandash.com, and Abby Kreitzler, who is the executive director and chief culture officer at Boca Group here in Chicago, and last but not least, Natalie Schmulik, the CEO of The Hatchery. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Bob. Thanks, Christina. Uh, welcome everyone to our noontime panel on the restaurant recovery. I thought we'd begin today by asking each of our panelists to introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about uh, your background. And, and today's bonus question is uh, your favorite restaurant in Chicago or favorite uh, cuisine type that you don't operate, no cheating. <laughs> we'll go, uh, Abby. Yeah, hello everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Abby Kreitzler. As uh, everyone mentioned, I'm the executive director and chief culture officer of Boca Restaurant Group. So happy to be here today. It's wonderful to spend an afternoon with you all and be able to talk about something we are all so passionate about. Um, it is always so hard to pick a favorite restaurant in Chicago. There are so many wonderful ones. I'm um, Samuel so Carnival here. It was such a classic staple. Um, just the diversity of Chicago and the culture that we get in the cuisines is so amazing. Um, personal favorites, Mio Takaya, if you have not been, is a wonderful. Joe Frillman, who is an alum, so I guess that's cheating a little bit, but he has a, an amazing restaurant called Daisy's, but there's just no end. I'm always discovering new places to dine, so it is wonderful. Um, did I get all your questions? Oh, and, and so my role at Boca, um, I, I have been with the company for 13 years, so really have gotten to be part of the journey of when we were just a couple restaurants, to uh, how we have grown over the years. And um, in my role, I get to work a lot with the employee experience within our company, um, our community relations, our events, uh, strategic planning and, and corporate system building. So I get to do a lot of the fun behind the scenes work that go into restaurant operations. Darren. Well, thank you, Bob. Uh, my name is Darren and I am a recovering restaurateur. <laughs> Actually, I, uh, as any restaurateurs on the, uh, on the call know, there is no such thing as recovery, only timeouts and I currently am on a timeout. After many, many years of helping build several uh, large fast casual brands, um, such as Moe's Southwest Grill, I uh, was one of the guys that uh, helped bring all the calories to uh, Cold Stone Creamery many, many years ago. And uh, just recently decided that I was going to start doing some consulting and I've been doing quite a bit of that and seeing a, a large uptick of interest, especially from young restaurateurs looking to, uh, to franchise. And I also uh, recently started a um, software company, uh, which is a subscription software company called Frandash. 
that is intended for franchisors to um, kind of keep everybody organized and you know create some asset value uh, across the brand. But uh, yeah, I am very, very passionate about this industry and am as excited as anybody on this call to see uh, hopefully the start of what's going to be a return to uh, in-store dining. Great, Natalie. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here. My name is Natalie Schmulik. I'm the CEO of The Hatchery Chicago. We're a nonprofit food and beverage incubator on the west side of Chicago, right in East Garfield Park. We have a 67,000 square foot facility. We have a shared kitchen space, as well as 54 private food grade production spaces and a culinary training center that we created alongside Chef Rick Bayless. Uh, we support our local community. We work with over 200 food and beverage entrepreneurs. So we get to see everything from the ground floor all the way up. Um, so we're always here to help. We focus a lot of our efforts and attention on women and minority owned businesses to provide some more diversity throughout the industry landscape. And we're always excited to partner with large companies as well. We help bridge the gap of how large CPG and restaurants can partner together with some of those early stage emerging brands. Um, so very excited to be here and continue the discussion. Okay, great. Ozzy. Hello, um, welcome. My name is Ozzy Godoy. I'm the general manager of Carnival, which is the iconic brand and iconic restaurant here on 702 West Fulton Market. Uh, been here for about six years. It will be six years in April. Um, like I said, we are, we are a Latin fusion restaurant. We've been here, I believe, before the West Loop was cool. I'll say that. Uh, um, um, and it's been amazing. You know, here we are at a fusion of colors, a fusion of emblematic uh, whimsy and whatever's going on outside. You can always escape to Carnival with a great Latin fusion feel, loud colors, and just, a, you know, a, a whirlwind of, of, of eye candy, if you will. Um, uh, I, I know you wanted to ask about my favorite cuisine. Obviously, it's Latin food, <laughs> but um, I won't let my owners know, but they'll probably know. But um, uh, Zuko, I think Zuko is one of my favorite restaurants. I think I've ever I've been there. It's unbelievable, and I'm amazed about how uh, how, chef, how Chef Carl's got done makes it happen. Uh, and like I said, we're we've just relaunched or reopened uh, on the 10th of February, and we look forward to consistently being around here for another 15 years and more. And we look we are just so excited and so blessed that we're serving guests again. So thank you for having me here. Appreciate it. Oh, great, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, let's kick it off with with uh, Ozzy and Abby. Uh, give us a peek behind the curtain. What's it been like to try and operate a restaurant in this city over the last year, and navigate what's gone on in the in in the world? We went from open to closed to kind of open to outdoor to indoor to back to kind of open. H how have you kept it together over this year? Ozzy, you can take a crack trip. Okay, yeah, I'll take it. You know, it was. Um... I would say the word that we kept coming up was humbling. Um, I think for us in the restaurant industry and also, you know, for hotels as well, but hospitality, a lot was exposed, you know, in terms of, you know, we've always been successful on such small margins, you know, when the weather was, and, and that really exposed a lot. So to be closed, which would never come to our minds. I mean, even with the 2008 crash and that, people went out to drink more, but here we were where we were closed, you know, for a pandemic. And, and that cash stopped and that revenue stopped, our guests stopped. Um, we went to, you know, we went to, you know, an immediate furlough. I mean, as we're thinking about it, what we had to do and how we had to strategize. Um, of course, we went to delivery and takeout and had a pivot. The word of the year was pivot, right? That was the 2020 word of the year and, and reimagining your business. Um, but then, you know, after a while, when we opened up with outdoor seating, then we had to be entrepreneurial. So now we're going from, streamlining to pivot to entrepreneurial. And you know what, what we thought was never going to work and what we looked at historically of, you know, no one eats outdoors for carnival. It's all the inside. We created a sidewalk patio. We created an ambiance. We had to think of our business differently. We couldn't stay in the same lane. And that really, really impacted us, but it impacted those guests, uh, you know, to look at us differently. And we saw the rewards of that as winter happened that was an issue. 
I mean, you know, we're not, I, my restaurant's not Scandinavia. So I know that they, <laughs> other restaurants had snow globes and, and that really wasn't in the cards for us, you know, and fighting through that, fighting through some of the protests and civil unrest, um, coming back strong with, uh, with the recent indoor opening again. And, you know, we looked at our business differently. Now we look at different revenue streams. We look at things differently in terms of the experience. Um, we had to take, uh, you know, a really, really strong approach at what our labor model was, what our food costs and days on hand inventory process was, our menu usage and ingredient usage. Everything was on the table. Uh, I'm pleased to say that we're as strong as ever. Um, the city-centric support has been incredible. We've always been a great suburban haven too, but the suburbs did their own thing basically, you know, by, you know, doing what they had to do to survive. And I tell you the open arms and the feedback from our guests of, of where our place is in the city and how we are considered this oasis has been just transformative. Um, we look forward to keep growing. We look forward to, to keep going. You know, we look forward to our private events coming back because that was 40% of our private events where all of them were gone. Um, where we usually go and we're looking forward to a strong a stronger quarter three and a, and, a, and, a, and a strong quarter four as the vaccine and the math works and as we continue to be very 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 cdc compliant so it's been an honor and it's upward and onward from here yeah i think we all hope the rest of the year uh, fares out better than it has over the last abby what's it been like at boca over the last year yeah you know as you said that keyword pivot is is absolutely what comes to mind and that has been such a difficult part of, you know, when everything first happened in the spring. We have contingency plans as a company for so much, but this was so far beyond what we could have ever imagined. And so we did, um, at first we shut down everywhere completely until we could really get our bearings and understand what was safe. And then we did start innovating and creating different models for each of our locations. Um, one of the most touching moments right after, you know, restaurants shut down, the Anthony Rizzo Foundation had called me personally and said, we want to provide meals for our hospital workers. Um, you know, can we, can we pay you guys to provide meals? And it was so amazing that people were thinking in that way. Um, and, and that program ended up being a huge lifeline for us of different partner organizations like World Central Kitchen, um, Frontline Foods to be able to pay our teams to stay employed to provide meals for hospital workers. So that was incredible. Um, we transitioned to a lot of virtual chef series, which was something we had never dreamed of doing and um, quickly got comfortable with. It started with corporate clients hosting gatherings for their groups all virtually. And then we started a whole community nonprofit um, campaign of being able to have nonprofits have a fundraising opportunity as all of them had to you know, stop their galas and their different initiatives. And then we started opening it to public classes. So that has been quite the journey. We've learned a lot. They're a lot of fun. Um, and then the takeout models, you know, we did a lot of meal kits, especially around different holidays, different features. Um, and that continues as we are crawling back with indoor dining and outdoor opportunities. You know, we, you, we've had to just keep pivoting and we are so grateful for our teams that have had to keep going from furlough to, you know, back working to back on furlough to back working. Um, and just, we are, are finally now transitioning from the word pivot to the path forward and light at the end of the tunnel and all these much more hopeful phrases um, because, you know, I, I think for everybody who is in the restaurant business in any way, it has certainly been a tough ride. And, um, you know, so many restaurants have had to close and we, consider ourselves so fortunate that we are still here and we are rebuilding um, and, and looking forward to that path ahead. I think you're on mute. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Natalie and Darren, um, one of the hallmarks of the restaurant business always has been creativity, innovation, entrepreneurship, uh, and, and this, uh, pandemic certainly has put those things to the test. And the lament that you hear is that people fear that their favorite neighborhood restaurant is about to be replaced with a red lobster because of the pressures that have been on entrepreneurs through this pandemic. Can you give us a sense of what of what you're seeing out there? How has this pandemic impacted entrepreneurs and our ability to be innovative and creative? 
Yeah, I will uh, start if you'd like. Um, first, I want to agree with Ozzy. I, I have heard the word pivot as uh, one of the most popular words of 2020. Well, that competes with you're on mute, which seems, <laughs> <laughs> which seems to be a favorite. Um, yeah, thank you for that, Bob. You couldn't have set that joke up any better if you tried. Um, you know, I, I deal with a tremendous amount of new restaurant concepts and, and entrepreneurs that are looking at franchising as an opportunity for growth and to, you know, really expand their brands. And I think that the general consensus is that with the unfortunate closings that we've seen over the last year, that it's created some opportunity for people from real estate prices, real estate availability, um, just you know, a general positive attitude of people are going to want to come back out to eat. You know, there are, there are fewer restaurants, but there's no fewer people that want to come and eat. And I think that these young entrepreneurs see, you know, uh, see some. Uh, see some opportunity to uh, get out into these neighborhoods and really expand their brands, provide hospitality services and, uh, and grow their businesses. Um, one of the things that a, a lot of our uh, young entrepreneurs are excited about too is, um, yeah. So you can tell that I am over 55 because I just <coughs> lost my place. Um, I know everybody's on mute. I can hear you laughing and I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I'm gonna turn it over to Natalie. Sorry about that. Well, Darren, I completely agree with you. I think there certainly is a fear. I think when the pandemic first started, we heard about all the pantry loading and then the primary items people were reaching for were all the things that we saw a major decline in data from previous years, right? People were reaching for cereals and Campbell's soups and ramens and all of the, the traditional comfort foods. And there were a variety of reasons for that, but it was short-lived and, and that's the good news. Um, you know, there's, we, we never see a, a ceased innovation in any way. In fact, usually when crisis, when faced with crisis, we actually become even more innovative because usually there's additional needs in place. There's a reason right now why everybody's looking at immune boosting benefits. And so one of the biggest requests from consumers right now is how do I boost, how do I get more immune benefits from both meals in restaurants, but also in consumer packaged goods. So we see this huge focus around ingredients that provide um, immune boosting benefits, but also adaptogens. We're all stressed out. We need stress relief. Um, so that hasn't gone away. And you know, at the hatchery, we haven't seen a shortage at all in innovation. In our monthly starting a food business class, we usually see 30 to 40 attendees. We saw over 70 attendees in our January class. So people are excited and they realize there's a need in the market. And I think one other thing that's been really interesting is restaurants and food businesses have been given a label that they didn't have to use previously, which is essential business. We knew this was an essential business, but this is the first time that most of these businesses have actually taken this essential status and gone, this is a very powerful label. How will I use this? And in turn, businesses that were not deemed essential are now thinking about how do I play in the food space? So am I converting my art gallery into a possible market? Uh, we've seen restaurants pivot extremely well in opening up spaces that have, you know, a ghost kitchen concept in the back, a pop-up restaurant, a, a market where why not sell ingredients that you're already purchasing for meals or meals to go. And so it's been amazing to see that. And I think, you know, Abby, you mentioned Daisy. So, you know, Daisy's was one of the first and it was great to see, um, but there's definitely no shortage of innovation. And I think this, this title of essential business is actually helping everybody think more about the opportunities in the industry. Thanks. I think we all value the importance of restaurants to the fabric of our communities. And uh, restaurants have really been hurting for the last year. Share, share with our audience the things that they might be able to do to, to support their local restaurants. Um, uh, innovative ideas, uh, things that they can do to, to help those uh, mostly entrepreneurial family-owned businesses survive. 
and that wants to take first crack. You know, I will try to uh, redeem myself here uh, now that I've gathered my thoughts. Um, one of the things that I tell people that is, I think the most important thing that we can do is as we all feel safe again, you know, and that's a personal decision for everybody, go back out and start visiting your restaurants in person. Take advantage of some of this indoor dining. I mean, hospitality is really the business that we're in. It's what we're the best at. You know, we weren't, you know, we're not just a business to provide sustenance. We're actually a business to treat people great, to give them a great experience. You know, like listen to Ozzy describe, you know, his restaurant. I mean, I want to go, but that's what I think we can do to really support restaurant tours because all of the new tricks that we've learned over the last year, the curbside pickup, the, you know, in innovations with delivery, and, you know, like Natalie was saying, some of the ghost kitchens and, you know, those aren't going anywhere. But I believe that once in uh, in person dining returns, that's just going to get us back to a double digit increase in restaurant sales. And I really do believe that. And you are starting to see the sales rise across the industry as uh, as we start reopening, because these new fun ways to deliver our food, those are great. And people are never gonna go away from those. I think it was Abby that was talking about how convenient some of those like curbside pickup. I mean, I love curbside pickup, but I also like to go in and enjoy the eye candy of a great looking restaurant and, uh, and a great, uh, you know, a great server experience. And, uh, and value indoor dining. So that's something that I think we really need to, to get out and do as soon as we feel like we can. Great, Abby? Yeah, I would say, you know, there, there are so many ways to support restaurants now. And Darren's totally right. You know, our teams, we're so happy to have people back in our spaces. We are a hospitality company. We love serving people and having that connection. And that was really hard to find that joy when you, you were not face to face with people. So certainly that, as you mentioned, private events, private events are such a lifeline to our industry, um, whether that be virtual now or in person. So, um, you know, continuing to support restaurants in that way, even if your company is not ready to host an in-person gathering there, we've been doing gift boxes for companies. We've been doing, as I mentioned, virtual chef cooking classes. There's so many different ways that you can still appreciate your teams while supporting restaurants. Um, you know, and in addition to the, the dining and the, the supporting that way, being kind when you're there. Um, we had talked about this a, a little bit internally, but you know, restaurant workers have struggled. It has been a rough year for them as so many other industries and so many other people. Um, we understand that people come in with all kinds of different expectations of what the safety standards should look like, you know, what their service experience should be. So just being kind and meeting each restaurant with where they're at, what policies they do have in place and, and respecting those that they're there for a reason um, of what works for that location. So we are so lucky to be in this city that is all about hospitality and we have wonderfully kind people that dine in our restaurants. As you touched on this as well, the support is amazing and, and really the core at why we do what we do. It's about bringing joy to people and serving people. So know that we are really excited to have you all back and that there are more ways than ever before to dine and enjoy meals, whether that is in our spaces or in all the different models that have been created. I think what happened. I think what Abby said is spot on. I mean, embrace the uniqueness of what our city has in terms of all the variety of food and, and, and really go out there. And, and the kindness, Abby, you are so spot on. Understand that we're doing whatever we can to keep our staff healthy as well. I mean, they've gone through so much. We went through two furloughs and where we had 204 employees. Now we have only 48, I think 57 right now. So, you know, and we're doing whatever we can for our staff that's still furloughed because of private events. So, yeah, that kindness, that patience, and trust me, uh, for that consumer in that Chicago and that's going to restaurants, know that we're doing everything as a community. It's so community driven. We want Boca to be successful. We want the other groups to be successful because it puts Chicago back in the driver's seat. What's good for them is good for us. And in terms of an experiential experience, we want you to have a great time at their restaurants. And when you want to have a pretty colorful and loud time, you come right down the street from us, okay? But really, 
look at it that way and look at it as an investment because we're all trying. I think literally in this city right now, every restaurant that I've been to and I go through a lot because I don't know what a kitchen is, but every restaurant has upped their games to make their food even more impressionable, more experiential, and even more in terms of that emotional connection. So know that we, our, our community, our, our industry is ready to serve. Yeah, you want to bring us on that question? Yeah, the only thing I would add to that, I think as, as customers, I think it's so essential to really support your local businesses. But, you know, being part of this really powerful network and many of you coming from this industry, I think one thing that we noticed and we discussed this earlier is that there's a lot being asked of restaurants, including how do we solve this problem? And, you know, restaurateurs and chefs and entrepreneurs are just trying to stay afloat and may not have the answer. So it's really up to us as an industry to look very deep throughout the supply chain and figure out what is a solution that I can uncover. So anything that we're thinking about, you know, supply chain solutions, thinking about, you know, real estate was brought up. How do we make physical brick and mortar spaces more affordable for these restaurants to reopen, to develop new concepts, to develop additional outdoor dining. I mean, it was it couldn't have been cheap to have to, while you have no longer have occupancy, you now have to invest in a plastic tent and heaters and outdoor seating. So we have to think of ways to provide support for these additional builds out so that restaurants can continue to offer safe solutions. And so I think there's everything throughout the supply chain. We really have to think carefully about that in order to help the restaurants who, you know, as Ozzy mentioned earlier, these are very tiny margins. And so I think we, we as a united front have to all work together in this industry to find those solutions. Yeah, thanks. Ozzy, let's, let's go back to you for a second. Um, Carnival has been a landmark in the city. Um, uh, talk to us about the future, the way you see the rest of this year panning out and, and talk to us also a little bit about the team. You've, you've had a lot of long-term employees there. And as you said earlier, unfortunately had to pare the staff down significantly. Um, do you see bringing most of those people, some of those people back in the cards? You know, you know I appreciate it, Mr. Habib, for, for asking me that. You know, it's been rough. Uh, Abby alluded to what Boak has gone through and you know what, um, we are optimistic. I think cautiously, I think there's some industry insecurity for a lot of our staff. A lot of our staff had to also pivot. You know, they took jobs in the suburbs. They took jobs in manufacturing. We lost some people to even Amazon. Um, we lost them to Postmates and different, you know, they had, they were in survival mode at all, completely as well. And you know what, there were some, you know, federal grants that were given as well. So they had to measure what that survivability was there too. Um, when I say cautiously optimistic, I do see, I mean, we're, We've been blessed, and I can't say enough, by the city support and on the support that we're seeing week to week that we're comping over the last week, which is really a, a blessing to see that, you know. Um, you know, I, I think looking at it um, in terms of these private events and how they're booking and what the future looks like, you know, it really was uh, kind of disheartening seeing housewares close and they rescheduled at, you know, to August. Um, we see a, a uh, we see corporate business still being very challenging. Um, we've I think the the change has been that the private events that we do have are mostly all social, um, and I think that's the that's the that's what's happening in the city right now. Um, but I do see a a better end of quarter three and quarter four. I see that as well. But it is a social structure. Hopefully, there's some business there, and we're primed for it. But a la carte will continue to grow, I believe. Um, and uh, once again, we'd have to be more entrepreneurial. With it warming up right now, that's going to be, a, remember, we have another 49, I'm sorry, 52 seats that now that people want to sit outside along with sitting in this vast dining room. So we're doing whatever we can. We're thinking of our business every single minute, every single moment to see what we can adjust and what we can pivot and how to be entrepreneurial to, to get what we can. But to me, the future looks bright, but cautiously and very, very systematically. Yeah, thanks. Um, Natalie, at, at uh, the, the hatchery, you've got a front row seat on, on food innovation and the up and coming restaurant tours. How do you see the conversation today different than a year ago? What are the things that you're talking about that maybe a year ago uh, weren't even on someone's mind? 
Yeah, I, I think, you know, one, and I just saw a question come in about ghost kitchens or cloud kitchens or dark kitchens or virtual kitchens. There's, they're, they're all interchangeable names right now. But, you know, we had a lot of catering businesses whose revenue went to zero overnight, right? Very event focused. And so many of them tried to switch over to a delivery platform. And we have concepts that started out as ghost kitchens and they, they're continuing to thrive right now. So I do think that's going to grow. We also heard from Chicago, top chefs in Chicago and big name restaurants who had launched takeout options. And when their restaurants open, they'd like to continue. And so they're looking for external space to be able to operate you know, this extension of their restaurant without necessarily diluting their brand. And so I think that's going to continue to grow. So I think everybody's thinking about that. I think one thing we've been talking about is exploring non-traditional retail channels. And that's been something that we've, we started to see that grow. Um, it kind of expanded as we looked at things like what Foxtrot is doing, right? And, and they're expanding rapidly. So looking at you know life outside of the Whole Foods and the Jewels and the Marianos of the world and getting into some local interesting stores and providing a more unique experience. Um, Pop-up Grocer is actually coming to Chicago right? So really, really exciting stuff coming. And then, you know, we're, so we're talking about how do you envision really non-traditional retail channels, direct to consumer options, and then also a shift in dining times. Now we have more people than ever working from home. While some will return to their office, many will stay at home because we found that we can be productive from our, our, our homes. And so that means there will probably be a change in dining times in the way we snack. So we're thinking about, you know, traditional breakfast might have been a 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. It might be a 7 a.m. to 12 p.m. right now, which I think is great because it actually allows us to utilize all hours of the day. Whereas, you know, with many restaurants, we were just focusing on, you know, these two hour prime time at, in the morning, during the afternoon and at dinner. And so now that consumers have this flexibility in their schedule, hopefully we'll see more of that. And so we're just encouraging all entrepreneurs to think about what do the next two years, three years, five years look like, not just focusing on today. And I think there's so much opportunity there. Darren, you're, you're an advisor to the restaurant industry and today that's an industry in crisis. Um, what, what's that like? What are your clients asking for? What kind of guidance are they, are they looking for? And how do you translate your experience growing brands like uh, Cold Stone and Moe's uh, in, in this unique environment that we're currently in? Well, I deal with a lot of franchisors and, you know, during, you know, the worst part of, uh, of COVID, you know, there was a lot of conversations about how franchisors needed to better support their franchisees, whether it was, uh, you know, royalty deferment, abatement, um, or just their communication style, you know, knowing that, you know, you can't go and do a compliance visit anymore, right? So you just need to really focus your conversations, you know, your strategies and understand that your franchisees, I mean, they're in survival mode. I mean, they're all trying to figure out how to stay in business, not just meet your, uh, your standards. Right, so there's a real fine balance in communication and and listening, you know. And every franchisee has a different story. They all have different issues that they're dealing with. And I think that one of the conversations that I had personally was really trying to enhance the listening part of the communication, understand what's really on their mind, and then try to come up with you know innovative ways to solve those problems. You know, and I think that, you know, one of the, one of the things that's going to really come, I mean, restaurateurs are some of the, you know, fastest moving, nimble, um, out of the box people that I've ever met in my entire life. I mean, it, it's so much fun to listen to other restaurateurs on this call talk about, you know, how they've pivoted and how they, you know, next thing you know, they've taken the outside of the restaurant and put it on the sidewalk and, you know, how, you know, they really never did delivery, but now they do primarily delivery. I mean, it is, uh, you know, I mean, it is a very fast moving, changing, very dynamic scenario when you've got, you know, municipalities and states 
I mean, with these ever-changing regulations, I think somebody said earlier, you know, you're, uh, I think it was you, Bob, you're open one day, you're closed the next day, you're, you can eat outside, you can partially eat inside, you're closed next week. You know, I mean, it's been very difficult, very expensive, and, and a lot of counseling really has gone on from franchisors to their franchisees uh, on how best to deal with the day-to-day -day running of their business. Not really on expanding their business, but frankly, just how to stay in business. Yeah. Abby, at, at Boca, you've got these 23 powerful chef-driven concepts. Um, and a concept like that or, or a, a group like that relies so heavily on the concept and culture. And how have you been able to maintain the culture through this tumultuous period? And then equally as important, um, how do you plan to make sure as things reopen that those restaurants reopen with the same luster that they had a year ago when, when we all uh, were faced with this closing? Yeah, I, both great questions, especially as my job does focus on the employee experience so much. You know, how do you create culture when you are having people furloughed and back and for, you know, with so much uncertainty and also not having that guest interaction. So that has been a huge emphasis of, of ours over the last year. Um, and, and it's been multifaceted. We put a lot of time and investment into the safety procedures, making employees feel comfortable with what standards we had in place, being really strict on those standards, both for guests and for our employees themselves. We actually hired medical professionals on our teams to help screen employees that had any symptoms of illness at all. We created a safety committee. We had um, a, a director of safety who, is, who does checks and balances to make sure all protocols are followed. You know, the other piece I want to talk about that, that has been really important to us is the mental health of our team members and everyone in this industry. So um, we have partnered with NAMI Chicago, who's a tremendous organization. They have done a number of virtual workshops on mental health for our team members, which have been so incredible. We have one coming up next week with another organization called Hope for the Day, and another wonderful organization. So that piece has been really important. We created an employee uh, relief fund, which is, had always been a dream of ours, but something that we were actually able to make happen in the early days um, that has continued to go on. So, um, and people have been really generous to support that fund. And that goes to our employees that are in need um, and, and that could use some additional financial support, whether they're furloughed or back to work or whatever their life circumstances are. Um, so that has been really key. And then, you know, there's also the guest experience piece. One of the transitions as we started bringing guests back into the restaurants, our service standards are so focused on um, the guest experience and being anticipating every need. So refilling that water glass before it's half full or, um, you know, being there to clear a plate. But when you have the mask mandates now and people having to put a mask on every time a server approaches, we had to really rethink that and really retrain our teams to say, you know, the best experience for the guests is not to have you approach the table all the time, but really give people space and, you know, bring their meals, but then give them the space to enjoy. So a lot of pieces of that in the culture too, of just what is the guest experience of how to still hospitality to know our servers are available but, but also give people space in a different way than we've ever operated before so um, it continues to be a constant dialogue that we all have with our teams uh, with our, our leadership but um, it is it is something that's so important and um, people have been so grateful a lot of our especially our culinary team but our service team too of saying we're so glad to put beautiful food on a plate and not just have it in a box anymore so rekindling that joy and getting back to the core of what we do is bring people joy. That's what the service and hospitality industry is about. So remembering that in, in all the work that you do, the why, why are you doing this? Why are you putting so much heart and soul into this work? And it really is to bring joy to people. And we talk a lot that joy, joy is needed more than ever. And it has been through this winter. So it is, it is a constant focus of ours. No, absolutely. Well. You know, I'll, I'll put in a plug though for the uh, following up on that, Abby, for our team members. Um, these are the most wonderful people. I'm sure the whole panel would agree. These are the most wonderful people you could ever encounter in, in, in life. And they've all been through hell and back in, in the last year. And audience members, when you 
to have the chance to interact with one of our team members, if you can be generous, you have no idea what that will mean to them, both Absolutely. psychologically and, and frankly, financially. Absolutely. Many, many, many of the people who support the restaurant industry in this city are, are on the brink and every little bit helps a bunch. Uh, Darren? I was gonna just say that one of the questions I've heard from people is, you know, do you think we'll ever have a normal again? And I, you know, I don't like to think that there's any such thing as a new normal, right? It's just an evolution. You know, we used to have eight track tape players and then we went to cassettes and CDs and now we're streaming music from our telephones. Well, this is happening in the restaurant industry. It, this is an evolution. People ask, are customers gonna come back? I mean, I, I mean, now everyone's going and picking up their food or having it delivered. Is anybody actually gonna go back into the restaurants again? And I think much like the movie theater business. I mean, I remember when Blockbuster, you know, took over the world, everybody said, well, that's it. That's the end of movie theaters. But it's not the end of movie theaters, right? Because we still like to go out. We still like to go have something to do. And we are social creatures. And, uh, and I think that that will be the same thing when we start uh, reopening these restaurants. Um, in fact, I saw something right before uh, the panel today. And, and that was uh, a guy on TV saying that they are maxed out on reservations. They've never seen anything like it. They've got more people wanting to come out to eat than they ever had in the history of their business. And that just shows that one, there's a pent up demand to go out, but people are not going to stop going out and enjoying our restaurants. I just don't believe that that is ever going to happen. You know, and like my friend Brian always says, I love having people bring me food. <laughs> yeah, a follow up question from the audience though is how about buffets? I mean, will we see the death of the buffet? <laughs> For, I mean, I could give you a little answer. I mean, for us, it, it's it's a pause. You know, I mean, there are things in our in our world. Maybe I even said the same thing that I think will come, will return a little bit. There'll be a, a delay of the norm, I believe. Like, you know, we use you know the inventory of tables to our rooms. We're always we're basically on top of somebody, whether it was four inches or six inches. Those days may be a little bit wary to get back to normal in fact that may not be maybe the standard new the standard is two feet you know to make a guest comfortable for buffets yeah that's one of those things that we're even you know we have an incredible mother's day brunch buffet that we do that packs them in you know you know that's literally having people and staff you know you got to snake the line and have staff you know ladle it for them so for us we only do it on major brunches um, but and some of our private events wants that as well. We have to think of different systems and different ways of doing it and queuing the line and having extra staff on to make sure that there's distance there and change and sanitize, you know, changing the ladles. And there's a lot more that goes with it. So I think there's just, uh, I hate saying that word again for the team, but you got to pivot. You've got to, you got to look at, at, you got to look at the steps and the safety protocols, but you have to think that way in terms of the entire service sequence and every single thing that we do that we thought was normal. I'd say that in retail, we've already seen that shift and it, it we won't see bulk foods coming back. So, you know, we, we see that, but the good things, you know, one thing closes, something else opens up. And so we know that, especially when it comes to grocery store spaces, there's a big intention around reinventing the space. And so what's exciting, and some have already done this, is there's now an opportunity to carry restaurant quality meals in place of those bulk bins. So a lot of restaurants and top chefs are, you know, you're gonna get to see your favorite meals there, which I think is something that would have always been of interest to customers and is going to be exciting. And also the frozen space. We talk a lot about how the frozen category has grown and there's this, you know, fresher than fresh appeal. And it's been traditionally, you know, not the most exciting meals in the frozen aisle. But now a lot of chefs are getting into that space as well, where you can take home an incredible frozen meal reheated at home. So again, there, you know, even though we will we'll see less of that bulk bin space, we're going to see more opportunity for better quality meals and chef crafted meals. And Natalie, another audience question that, that touches on that. We've seen the growth of these ghost, ghost kitchens through the pandemic, like Guy Fieri's uh, Flavor Town. Uh, do you think that's a trend in the industry? Will there be more ghost kitchens and fewer sit-down restaurants? Or is that 
will it be additive? Will there be both? Um, how do you how do you see this playing out as the pandemic goes away? Yeah, there will be both. I, I think Darren said it right. There's nothing like going to a restaurant for the social experience and we are social creatures. So that is not going to go away. That's one of the biggest things that customers were craving during lockdown was it's not the same to sit down and eat the meal at home out of a box. We still wanna go out. We wanna see people, talk to people and dine with them. So I don't think there will be fewer dine-in restaurants but we will see a creative approach where dine-in might be split into a combination of you can dine there, but in the back end, the kitchen might expand and it will allow for more of a ghost kitchen concept because the great thing about ghost kitchens is trial and error is built into it. It's really difficult to scratch off the name of a brick and mortar restaurant and put something brand new up. But as a restaurant, you can use the ghost kitchen concept to test out meals and flavors and concepts and get immediate feedback from your customers. And then those meals may eventually transition onto the main menu. So I don't think ghost kitchen concepts will go away. I think there's a lot of room for improvement. I think they're getting better as they should. And I think a lot of chefs and, and well-known restaurants are getting into the space, which is helping a lot because they really did start off with a lot of you know no-name brands or big franchise restaurants. And I think right now you're seeing more, you know, smaller restaurants getting involved, you know, Boca's done some great work around their chicken shop and, you know, all these great concepts. And again, it allows you to test out all these great ideas that you may have not been able to test in your traditional restaurant concept. Yeah, thank you. You know, uh, there are now a couple of rest, uh, a couple of audience questions uh, regarding what normal means in the restaurant business. When will we see it? Will we ever see it? What has permanently changed in the restaurant industry that, that may never go back to the way it was a year ago? And that's a tough one. Anybody want to take a crack at, at those questions? I'll, I'll tell you. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Well, I'll tell you, like, for us, for a restaurant, it's, we've always been very P&L driven. We've been very, very, very conscious of, of every cost, everything like that. But it's really caused you to even look at even, even, even more in depth you know, um, ordering what you need, looking at our, our, at our hours of operation, things of where, where we can, you know, um, execute at a high level, but also be very wary of the, the financial climate right now. So everything was on the table, like I said it before, but we had, a, we, we had a look at, you know, how, how we did service, how, you know, how, what was the support structure that we used to use what was the menu ingredients? Is there, are we cross utilizing menu ingredients smart to make sure that we don't have this one specific item that goes only in one dish and the shelf life is 12 hours? What could we do differently? So I think a lot of that, you really had to, you know, you really had to detail your business from, from food to beverage to the whole entire, you know, business plan and put it on a board and put it on it, you know, and look at where that was, you know, long gone were the days where you had dogs on your menu because you know what you know we have to have that on the menu long gone were those days that you had those things that maybe owners loved you know and, and they wanted that dish you had to sit back and go you know what this costs this much uh like i said before room inventory is different i, I think people will be hesitant to sit as close for a while um you know we we, we eliminated 56 tables from our restaurant um that's going to be a different thought process, you know, um, and service, service. And I love what Natalie said. Um, it is, we've had a pivot, you know, this takeout kit stuff and this thing that we do and adding myself and a couple of the managers to the insurance to deliver stuff. <laughs> you know what? That's a reality. You know, that's a reality. And you got to look at your business and not where, where you were before in the driver's seat. You better have about six different lanes that you that you're going to have to get drive revenue in. I would say a few things that probably won't return it for, for the better in some ways, you know, food safety expectations, that's, you know, the bar set very high right now. And so when we walk into a space, I think this was always important, especially in the food industry, because there's a lot more liability, but safety protocols won't go away. And then utilizing digital resources. So, you know, the QR codes for menus, that's a great way to eliminate, you know, paper menus that were often thrown out and, and sustainability is top of mind. Earth Day is right around the corner. So we're trying to think, and especially with all the takeout packaging, there's a lot of focus right now on sustainable packaging. 
So I would say, you know, utilizing the QR codes, people being able to pay the bills, same thing by using these QR codes and payment methods where you can do everything from your phone right now. And I think it helps the restaurant and it helps the, the customers. Some customers, I, I know there's some people who still like the tangible menus and you know want the, the receipt and that experience, but I think that those digital assets are not gonna go away. One of the uh, audience members asks if um, any of the panelists have read Danny Meyer's um, comments in Inc. Magazine where he said, uh, I hope we never return to how we were. Uh, and, and he had some conclusions after that. Has anyone read that? I saw that comment. I have unfortunately not. We we um, follow a lot of what Danny Meyer does. He's been a wonderful mentor to us. We've called their company before for advice or guidance. So I will be reading it as soon as we get off this call. I'm very interested to hear what he has to say. Me as well. Yeah, I, I have not yet seen it. I mean, I, I could I could guess because he's had some pretty outspoken positions on different aspects of the industry. Um, what conversations have you been having? with your customers, your, your end users, uh, do they expect consumers to return um, with less, the same or more enthusiasm when we finally hit our post-pandemic equilibrium? Uh, we think more, we, we have had such a wonderful support, as I know you touched on this well, of our diners coming back and just being so happy to be there, um, as happy as we are to have them. You know, people miss community. People miss the ability to experience great beverages and food. I know I'm so tired of my own cooking and, you know, <laughs> mess. We, I used to eat so much better when I was working. <laughs> um, we are seeing a lot of enthusiasm. We also have, I mentioned, of private events in our restaurants. We have a catering a couple of catering divisions as well, you know, and people are starting to rebook their weddings or, or starting to plan these gatherings in the future. Um, and, and I do think we are going to have a further appreciation for hospitality and togetherness when that time comes as vaccines continue to roll out than ever before. You know, similar to how we saw the Roaring Twenties, I, I do think people are going to be ready to be together and celebrate. I agree with Abby. I think that we are going to see a resurgence unlike we've never seen before. I think there is such a pent up demand for just going out and socializing with friends and family and doing it in an environment, you know, that is comfortable uh, with hospitable people, you know, being able to take care of the servers again, having them take care of you. I, this is inevitable. This is, uh, you know, I, I, I had to laugh at Ozzy. I, I, I've actually really enjoyed listening to Ozzy. <laughs> Not laughing at you, laughing with you, but, it, you know, Ozzy talks about how, you know, to come up with this or create that or, you know, the big buffet line. I mean, that's a great question. I don't think I've ever even thought about the buffets again. <laughs> I mean, I, I love buffets, don't get me wrong, but I'm thinking, okay, so do they go away? And I don't know whether they do or they don't, but I promise you this, people like Ozzy will figure it out. <laughs> you know, how about though the, the entrepreneur restaurant right. tour? Uh, one of the things in this city we've been blessed with, and I think one of the things that makes the Chicago restaurant scene unique of anywhere else in the country, but for maybe New York, is the entrepreneur restaurant tour. And that group has largely been crushed in the last year. What will the long-term impact be on the entrepreneur restaurant tour? Is there is this belief that we'll see more and more corporate-owned restaurants um, where the balance sheets backed up the uh, the ventures, as opposed to the people who put their blood, sweat, tears, and talent in, into their own business? Anyone have a forecast on that? I, I do for sure. Restaurant tours are resilient. Americans are resilient. They will come back out to the restaurants. And for every one that closes, there's two that's looking at opening. That's never going to weigh. The entrepreneurship of America is alive and well. And I believe that you will continue to see more and more entrepreneurs entering the restaurant business, trying their hand at creating a brand. Um, yeah, I, I do not believe that this is going to be a world dominated with chain restaurants. It's not going to happen. That's not who we are. And there are way too many restaurant entrepreneurs out there to let that happen. 
you, you, Darren, you said something earlier about um, one thing that you think will change in the future is that the restaurateurs will be more financially savvy, that they're going to negotiate better lease deals. And hopefully landlords respect that a restaurant brings more than just a check to, uh, to the value of a property. Um, do you see that as, as a meaningful change in the industry where restaurateurs have learned their lesson, razor thin margins, they need a little bit more of, of uh, uh, slack, if you will, to be able to survive the potential ups and downs of the market? Yes, I've seen that with several clients that I work with that are being a little bit more aggressive, going out and looking for space and asking for a little bit more tenant improvement money to build their space. Uh, you know, lower, um, trying to figure out how to lower their rent factors because we do operate on a slum margin, right? So, you know, just like Ozzy talked about, we're very P&L driven. You know, anybody that's not has left our industry already because you have to be. And so, yes, I do think that, especially in real estate, I think not only are the restaurateurs trying to be a little bit more aggressive about the deals that they're making, but I also believe that the landlords recognize we've got to have that driver to the center. There's got to be that daily needs part to you know our strip center or our lifestyle center. And we've got to make that something that is appealing to the restaurateur because I mean, rents are tough. I mean, you look at some of the rents in Manhattan, that's why the prices are so high. And I think now with all the vacancies, a lot of landlords are rethinking that. Uh, Ozzy, one of, the, one of the things that's got to be very difficult right now with the volatility in the business um, is trying to predict your scheduling, your food purchases, your, your prep. Uh, how have you managed through that? That's not yeah, a you know, question. That's a great question. It, it, it's looking at our business, you know, before we would look, and I think Abby, you know, I mean, Boca Group, I mean, honored, you know, I mean, to be neighbors, you know, um, you had to dissect your menu and your world on a day by day basis. Um, you know, I, you know, my forecasts, they're always done weekly, but it's almost like a day. And days on hand inventory was a different world, you know, before we wanted seven days. Inventory. No, you know what, I'm ordering for the next two days. I'm ordering, and it's always as fresh as always, but I'm ordering in those cycles. Um, we don't have private events as of yet. So that changed, you know, I'm, when I'm talking about streamlining labor and looking at service and the, the sequence and what this support staff is and looking at things like that, we've had to dial that down, but really make it a conscious culture for us so that, that we're all looking at the same thing while, while making sure we execute, execute exceptionally and, and, and to meet the expectation of our guests. You know, right now we're in this process right now where we got some, we got our sea legs back, you know, and right now we're at that process where we're gonna start expanding the menu, you know, cause there are some wonderful things that are on there that we've special that used to be on our menu that sold but in like minutes <laughs> out, you know? Um, and now we're at that position to do that. And now we're in the position of, you know, we looked at how our prep levels were, how many prep people we needed, what that looked like, shelf life. So everything's on the table. And I, I will say this, when I kept using the word humbling, it was because what we thought we were great at, my goodness, we could be 10 times greater. And we've learned a lot more to be even better than before. Yeah, for sure. Okay, lightning round, we're, we're at the end of our time. Uh, I'll ask a final question, it'll be personal. Uh, I think I told you, I, I, I'm opening two hotels and two restaurants in the next 30 days. Second half of this year, will it bring me tears or cheers? Cheers, so many cheers. 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 cheers, two for cheers. Definitely cheers. <laughs> Three for cheers. Definitely cheers. <laughs> cheers, 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 cheers. Well, that's cheers. an encouraging note, and it's always good to leave any discussion on a, on a high note, and I think we've done that. Um, oh, we're getting we're getting uh, comments from the audience. Cheers too. And I, I do think stronger. we all feel we all feel some sense that the worst is over and that we're going to start to see some return to normalcy. It's been in the news the last couple of days. The city's talking about festivals and auto show and um, increasing the seating in restaurants. And I think for those that have survived this last year, the uh, that news is very welcome. Uh, that will that will conclude our time for today. Megan, is there a closing? Do we have a? Yeah, over to Christina for some closing remarks. 
I just want to thank you, Darren, Ozzy, Bob, Natalie, and Abby for the fantastic discussion. As a longtime resident of Chicago and frequent uh, you know, consumer and, and diner, I um, also sort of echo the, the cheers comment. I, I think there is a lot of pent up demand and um, I think you know, better times are ahead. But I will just wrap it up by saying it was fascinating to hear all of you talk about sort of the uh, innovation, the pivoting, the entrepreneurial spirit, and that even when we are sad that a certain restaurant has closed or you know, we feel the pain of those whose businesses have not survived, that we are looking forward to those new entrepreneurs to step in and keep the city um, revitalized and, and all of the good work that you guys are doing to keep Chicago on the map as a uh, you know, food and restaurant destination. So I will just quickly note that um, we appreciate you attending this Chicago, Chicago Executive Chicago um, event today and that there is another one on Wednesday, March 17th um, for the Innovation Forum hosting a conversation around redefining transportation innovation in cities. So that one will be fascinating as well. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you Thanks, so much. Everyone. Have, have a, a great one. day. Have a good one, too.